literally minutes after Mark Butcher and Ben Jones left the room after our recording, the press release dropped that England have included Haseeb Hamid and Sam Billings in the England Test Squad for the New Zealand series. Obviously, um, both huge stories, but particularly Hamid. Um, this is happening because Ben Folkes has torn his left hamstring. Um, Hamid obviously played for England in 2016, had a few very, very tough years, ended up leaving Lancashire, joining Knotts. Phil, this is an amazing story. This is a rousing tale right here. I've never seen Taha happier, <laughs> by the way. Um, yeah, look, the story's well trod. Uh, a, a glorious elemental talent, fast tracked in the England side, ordained by Coley in that uh, couple of cameos against India, and then the mother of all bad trots, so bad that it looked like he might actually uh, fall away from the game itself. Uh, it, it turned grim for him at Lanx. He moved on to Knotts. There were echoes of the old class last year, and this year he averages 52, 52 53. 53, yeah. For for not so suddenly flying, I mean, he's made a couple of hundreds and a ninety odd. Uh, the the innings that really really ran it home for me actually was a forty nine he made against Essex, uh, over overcast leaden skies, ball doing everything. Essex had been rolled and he batted on a different level to everyone else in that game, um, and he played the moving ball, the late moving ball, immaculately. And I thought, all right, I've kept Stum as best I could, but I couldn't resist calling that out on Twitter yeah. because it looked like the boy had what we've always known is there. It looked like it had returned for him. We've been quite cautious in the show and our praise for him because of the, the journey he's had over the last couple of years. Do you, do you think there's a danger? This is, this is too early. This is only six or seven games into his return to, to something like he is batting in 2016. I think it's the perfect way to get back in because realistically, unless someone busts a finger in the next 48 hours, he's probably not going to be playing that first test match. So what it does do is it prepares the ground for him and also for the punters as well, for the fans. I mean, you know, I've texted a couple of mates and straight away they're, oh my word, you know, <laughs> Taha's um, echoing how people feel, I think, around the game, you know, to see, see the boy back. But crucially, he can be broken back into the system slowly, He's not going to be opening up against Trent Bolt and, and Southie next week necessarily unless something unforeseen happens. But he, he is now a part of the conversation and throwing it forward. And we are allowed to do this now, legitimately throwing it forward. Um, India's attack are over here, uh, obviously that part of the summer. And then, of course, the big one in the winter. He has to now be a part of these conversations. And it's, it's stirring stuff because people who know him know him as a as a sparky, sharp kid who went through a terrible, awful time where, um, he, yeah, not only did he, he not trust himself at the crease, but he'd lost his love for the game off it as well. And, and so to see him back uh, is, is a rousing moment for the game, really is. Mm. Um, and also, big news for James Bracey, who will almost right. certainly play the first test match as, as a wicketkeeper, batting at six or seven. Yeah, meteoric rise for for, for James Bracey. Uh, two years ago, he was he was not known outside Bristol. I think you did the first real interview with him. You were telling me about him before I'd even heard of him. He's twenty three, I think. Um, sharp and mature beyond his years. I spoke to Chris Dent, his ca county captain, about him yesterday, actually, um, and and he he says the boy is is rock solid, mentally rock solid. And he said every time he's been asked to step up at every level of the game. He's done it unflappably and he will now almost certainly be keeping wicket and batting seven for England next week. Um, that is a huge moment for the lad and probably a feather in the cap as well for the, for the system as well. You know, fair play to the selectors, whoever they are these days, to have identified him a year or two ago as somebody with a, with a little bit of something, a little bit an un unusual cricketer. He didn't have ways. a huge record behind him when he first got that Lions call up. So by no kind means. of backed up by how well he's done this year in the championship. But this is the first really big season he's had in first class cricket. Yeah, and back, that's three for Gloucester yeah. and has made good runs this year, uh, um, including a particularly good couple of innings against Somerset, who are obviously a gun side. Craig Overton opened the bowling for that side. Two good innings, including an unbeaten 70 odd to win that game that Chris Dent said to me yesterday that, that took him in into the conversation and into that squad, he thinks. Thing is, he bats three for, for Gloucester. In this instance, he'll be batting seven and keeping. Is that preferable for him? Possibly, possibly. It certainly makes it more, more likely that he was going get to the, get 
get that debut. And I mean, you're talking Lords, you're talking Broad and Anderson, keeping to those two. So I mean, w- w- what a moment for the lad. Um, you see that Sam Billings is in as well. I know, obviously, you've got Butler's Butler's unavailable, Best is unavailable, folks is injured. Bracey's ahead of him, so he's quite a long way down the queue. But Sam Billings hasn't played a lot of Red Bull cricket recently. His, his recent Red Bull record is good, mm. but he's not played a lot of it. No, this is true. But he's a very versatile utility player, isn't mm. he? And and they like him around the setup. Chris Silverwood, Lord of all he surveys, he's picked him out. Um, you know what you'll get with him. You'll get absolute commitment. Um, and and he's a cricketer who can fulfil various roles. Uh, he's never been close to a Red Bull test match, in fairness. Um, and in truth, he might not be that much closer now. You know, they are scrabbling around to try and cover all bases here. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's a good story for a very likeable cricketer in Sam Billings. Um, but I mean, a word for Ben Folks. I mean, my word. It, it's a brutal turn of events for, for, uh, for one of the great, you know, glovemen in, in the world, as we know. He's played two, three test matches away from home. A bit more than that. He's probably played, probably six or seven now. Oh, right, but, okay. but yeah, never played one at home. <laughs> never, never played one at home. And yeah. he looked dead cert to play at Lords next week, but, but he's not going to play. Um, yeah, and and to rip a hamstring a week out from a home debut at Lords. Yeah, uh, that is a brutal turn of events mm. uh, for a brilliant cricketer who whose whose record in Red Bull cricket in England has been a bit indifferent with the bat. Obviously, as, as a keeper, he's, he's, he's untouchable, mm. but with the bat. And so this would have been a brilliant opportunity to play a pedigree side. He'd have been assured of those two test matches. And he said to me and said to many people in the past that because of the, the quality and depth of keeping in England, he'll take any, any moment that he plays for England as, as a godsend, as an event in and of itself. And, and he said to me recently, two or three years ago, he thought, I can be England's keeper. Now he doesn't think like that. Now he thinks... Every opportunity to get a cap will be something mm. to cherish. So for this to happen for him is a, is a brutal turn of events. Mm, absolutely. Um, I think we've covered everything there. <laughs> um, you've got a, quite a long show to look forward to, folks. There's a lot lot in it. Um, we hear about Ben Jones' new book. We get really, really into technique, which we don't often do on the show. Um, and that's a really interesting chat on that. So enjoy the rest of the show. Hello and welcome to the Wisden Cricket Weekly Podcast. I'm Yaz Rana and with me today is former England batsman Mark Butcher, Wisden Cricket Monthly Editor-in-Chief Phil Walker and Quickviz Analyst Ben Jones, who has a new book out in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, ben, I think the last time you were with us was when Pant led India to that famous victory at the Gabba. So is it that you only join us when you experience a major life event? Yeah, yeah. I mean, both of those register similarly on the, like, yeah, the Richter <laughs> scale of my life. Yeah. Um, no, I think that... I was slightly slightly less sleep deprived today. That was very much kind of just fresh out of battle last time. So hopefully I sound a little bit more, you know, with it than Wonderful. I did then. Wonderful. Um, going to kick things off slightly differently to you to, 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 to usual today uh, with with Phil's moment of the week because I think All it's right. so interesting um, and just an, an experience I think a lot of cricket fans would. I hope you haven't like oversold this. Well, it is, it's Almost certainly have. <laughs> <laughs> This is probably old hat to you, Mark. Um, but I went up to, to Beefy's house on Monday up in, up in North Yorkshire. Uh, and I've never been up there before, that goes without saying. And I never thought I'd ever get an invite, but, but I did. Uh, and we went up there, me, Ben Gardner, our empire, empire builder and, and uh, a videographer as well. And we did, we did a turn in Beefy's um, uh, lakeside hut. And we did a, the photos are incredible. We did an interview <laughs> over the afternoon with his his dogs running around our feet and a couple of bottles of the Botham wines on the on the side. Uh, we had a we saw off a bottle of white. Me, me and me and Serian. Mm. We are like that these days. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was a truly surreal experience. It's one of those things where when when you get the nod, you obviously can't can't hesitate. You know, uh, Botham's house kind of has sort of mythic qualities doesn't it in the story of English cricket you know famous barbecues and, and, and middle of the 81 series and all of that and and uh, I can't say I was entirely relaxed going into it the, the old Eels song Susan's house was ticking over in my head going over to Beefy's house I just couldn't kind of quite get it out of my head and and he was uh, he was lovely so, as I say surprisingly yeah surprisingly lovely because he you know his 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 reputation is such that 
you tread carefully around him. You know, there are certain big beasts in English cricket, mm. and then there's he's both. Not, he's not Van Morrison, you know. You're no, no, right. I know, but but to the uninitiated, you know. Yeah. Um, and and he was lovely, actually. And it's forty years, of course, since eighty one. So that was the the vague hook, um, that and 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 the bottles of plonk on the table. Mm. Uh, and I mean, I think I probably remembered his career slightly better than he did in certain points, you know. So, so I think I tried to steer him yeah. down certain roads. But he was, he was great, great value, and in really good form. And, Excellent. And it was, it was an unusual day, let's say, from start to finish. We were stuck on the on the train going up to Darlington for two hours, stationary because of a cattle strike coming down from Durham, where a herd of cows had just wandered onto the line and and, and taken one taking the train at full mm. pelt from the other way so oh, it was a, it was a surreal day really from start to finish um but yeah one that i won't forget in a hurry yeah and and listeners you'll be able to listen to the conversation phil had with beefy uh, in a couple of months time we're going to look back at the 81 ashes 40 year anniversary mm. obviously this year um in conjunction with both and wines and i've listened to a little bit already and Have you? yeah and Is it any good? it's really good but also the the background noise is amazing because you just hear the birds singing Throughout the whole interview, which is lovely. Um, yeah, it's it's quite a setup. You, yeah. you can well imagine. Yeah, you, know, you can hear it over Phil singing. Presumably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let, let's let's get into some newsy stuff. Uh, earlier this week, there were reports in India and the UK that the BCCI had informally asked the ECB whether they would consider moving the dates of the fifth and final test of the England India series later this summer to better accommodate the rescheduled second half of the IPL. English cricket Twitter united in fury against the idea. Um, but last night, Ali Martin in The Guardian reported the ECB have held firm, having already sold out the first three days at Old Trafford. Um, but I, I thought this was just the obvious thing to do. Um, <laughs> but but you, you don't agree. Well, listen, I, t- I take a deep breath here. <laughs> As does the nation. As does the nation. I think... It's a massive missed opportunity. What? Bear watch, with watch me. Watch that career. Just Bear with me. <laughs> right. Now, the ECB very rarely, very, very rarely, in fact, I would go as far in the last 10, 15 years as to say never have something that the, uh, that the BCCI wants or needs. And with the 100 sort of floundering because of covid and 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 overseas players cancelling contracts not being able to come this year is kind of a bit of a write-off ecb are absolutely desperate to kind of to make this thing work they have to be you know they've kind of bet the house on the hundred and it's kind of every turn it, it seems as though a greater power doesn't want it to happen and so for me this was the opportunity where you say okay We'll bite the bullet. We're going to get, we've got the wrath of English cricket fans anyway. They hate us because of the 100. They hate us because we've, we, we seem seeming, seemingly sort of uh, are ignoring them at every single turn. So I'd say, so you'd say, well, okay, well, we'll take it on the chin. They don't like us anyway. We will do this for the BCCI on the proviso that we get Coley, we get Dhoni, we get whoever we like for three, signed up for three years to play in the 100 starting 2022 mm. and you you have leverage for the first time ever you have something that they need that they want um obviously the bcci is going to lose a lot of money if they don't get the the IC, the, the, the ipl in the window you also have the, the the extraordinary sort of you know spectacle of of, of the ipl being finished um you know at the behest or because of english cricket and you use that lever in order to get something that we desperately mm. need um, and so I think that there is an opportunity missed. I, I completely understand why they didn't do it and why they, they I bottled it is probably a bit harsh. <laughs> <laughs> because they have just spent the last two years kind of upsetting English cricket yeah. fans in, in ways that they haven't been upset ever. And they've so, already sold out the first three and days. And they've already sold out the first three days. And so their currency with the fans at home is at an all-time yeah. low. Yeah. Yeah. But when you have nothing to lose... You know, perhaps that's the time where you you make your boldest gambit yet, yeah. and so I, I think there was there's an opportunity missed there. Listen, I you know I, I've made my my thoughts known about all of these things over a wide over a long period of time, um, and that you've you've kind of you know you, you've got yourself to a, into a point where whereby you have very very little manoeuvrability with your home with your home support, 
but for once you had you had the big big beast on the table and with a knife hovering over its neck and you could have leveraged it to something that would have would have done you a favor somewhere down the line the, the, the optics are so important in all of this ian watmore's just come into into the job into the big job and he's he's impressed a few people and he's he's quite a steady steady hand i think after the more sort of volatile predecessor in in colin graves but if he had been seen to shift a marquee test match out of the calendar with the first three days already booked in and a sellout in order yet again to accommodate the IPL, then that looks terrible to the average fan. And, and it looks like you don't really have any man- manoeuvrability there. And it will play well. PR-wise, it will play well. Among the rank and file out there in the game, it will play well. Uh, where I totally can't see where you're coming from, we had the chance here not just to... to uh, reposition ourselves in the ongoing sort of power grab with the BCCI, but also to actually put on a world event in our stadia for our fans. Now, on the one hand, Lancastrian fans up in, up in Old Trafford would rightly be incandescent that their test match would have been shifted. Um, but the flip side of that, if we're talking about bringing the game, democratising the game and all, that, all of that, the flip side would have been that more people could have seen these great players across the country in this crazy jamboree squeezed into three or four weeks at the end of the season. Mm. Um, and after the shit weather we've already had, maybe we would have had a nice autumn. Who can say? Um, so I, I, can understand, I can understand the frustration from, from your point of view. I can understand that. By the same token, rather boringly, I can also understand why the ECB have, have chosen this call because it will play well. Trust me, it will play well. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Ah. I think it does. It, it, it does. I mean, it does play well. But I think it's, again, they've boxed themselves into a point where they can only be short-sighted because of the fact that they've, that they've spent the last two and a half years upsetting the fans to such a point where they feel like, well, we can't do it again. We ah. just simply cannot. How realistic do you think it, w- it would have been if the ECB said, yeah, fair enough, uh, let's have the IPL here, but can we have your players next year for, for the next... That's a good question. Well, look, I, mean, I, I don't know. That. I don't know how realistic it would have been, but unless you, but unless you sort of dangle that mm. sort of Damocles over their throat, you're never going to know. Mm. Yeah. You see what I mean? If you, if you say, okay, fine, all right, but we mm. understand there's a bit of a bind here and, and we understand... We want to help you out as much as we yeah. can to get the IPL done. However, this is what this is the cost. This is what we want in return. And if the BCCI says no, and we're gonna we'll rearrange it somewhere else, it's fine. You've not mm. you've nothing ventured, nothing gained. Yeah. But unless you have, I, who knows? They might have had this conversation behind closed doors and come come up against you know neither side being at willing to willing to move on the negotiations. Again, that's fine as well. You ask my opinion. That's my opinion is, is that I would have tried to move heaven yeah. and earth to make that happen as much of a dog's breakfast as it would have made the rest of our summer. But again, let's face it, it's a dog's breakfast anyway. Mm. It's, you know, there's nothing about the way that this summer is panning out. There's nothing about the way that the 100 looks like it's going to go ahead because of the, the lack of overseas players. There's nothing about the way that, the, you know, I kind of it skipped my attention that, it, that the Oval wasn't the last Test match this year, that it was Old Trafford. No, nothing is in the place where it would normally be. <laughs> so if you shift it again, who's going who's gonna to notice? Well, the, <laughs> but you will get, you do get the chance to watch the IPL in, in England for the, for the first time yeah. ever, um, which would have been extraordinary. Ha, ha, do, do you think it might have a negative impact on the fabled ECB-BCCI relationship going forward? The, the BCCI, such as its power, assumes that everyone should should and will fall into line and the ECB have maybe rebuffed them here? Do you think there could be a... I don't know, but we don't know what's happened, do we? No. I mean, we're, we're speculating wildly horse. about what may or may not have gone on in the in, in the halls of power. And they, as I've said, they might have had this conversation. Yeah. But but one thing is reasonably clear, and I've got to establish that it's not absolutely confirmed yet. These no, are the reports it's just in the last reported yesterday, hours. yeah. But one, one thing it does seem to be is that the ECB have rebuffed the BCCI's mm. uh, specific... Mm. Uh, request now if that is the case that is significant in itself one I think. one question that's related to that is how essential do you think those overseas stars are to the hundred um th- oh, that huge. it's worth bargaining over Massively. so so with the reported absentees this summer do you think how, how big do you think that will be they're huge they're so, huge listen the, the the overseas players that are not coming the australian overseas players that you know the west Indian, whatever they might be that are not coming for it this year is a is a big big miss you throw in a couple of marquee West, uh, marquee Indian names. As I've said, I've told the story many times before. MS Dhoni, here, September, help for heroes. 
signs up to play a game a game on Thursday on the Tuesday. They went from four thousand tickets sold to twenty four thousand tickets sold just on the on the on the mention of his name. Hmm. Right? It's it's enormous. The Indian hmm. diaspora here would would you know they would fall over themselves to come and see Virat Kohli representing London. London Invincibles or whatever it might be next year. And if you can book that in for two or three years, you know, th- th- there's more at stake here than just next year and, and this year's IPL. It's about how, you know, about, about the sort of where, where the balance of power sits in cricket going forwards. And at the moment, all of the balance of power is with the BCCI. Mm. And, there, and as far as I can see it, and again, I might be being massively naive, there was a chance to shift it back a little bit. Because any time you have something that somebody else wants, you've got bargaining power. Mm. And generally speaking, we've never had any bargaining power. But all of a sudden, we've got so Not since 2003. Not since Stanford. If I'm, are we allowed to talk about that? Yeah, let's go. Not <laughs> since Stanford have, 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 have the ECB been in a position whereby their sort of short form or their, their competitions, as, the, as, as T20 was back in 2003, was our baby. And ever since then, we've kind of given it away to everybody else. And the BCCI have gone, you know, got taken it and, and gone berserk with it in a way that mm. we were not, unable to. There was a chance here to wrestle some of that back. You can find Butcher at Mark Butcher 72 <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> can I, can I, I will be muting, <laughs> be muting the, uh, the, the tweets when they go out. <laughs> can I just say it's nice yeah. not to be the most contrary person in the room for once. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just, just quickly, yes. to kind of reflect on that, I think. The ECB, because of the way that they've gone about introducing the 100 and the way that they've gone about constructing the schedule over the last few years and the way they've gone about you know, positioning themselves in the international community, they've almost lost that ability to, to sell another kind of idea to the, to the English cricket public. They can't go and say, this is a three-year thing, we're going to have Coley come in next year. Because, as you say, like, we've, they've put up with so much disruption, they've annoyed the fans so much that they've, they've lost that right. They've even lost the right to have kind of subtle PR. Because I think you could sell you know, with the idea that we've got leverage now on the on, on the BCCI and we're going to use that to like get ourselves back at top table kind of thing. You could sell that very well and make, and the public, I think, even the more conservative public who have pushed back against the changes, mm-hmm. I think would go, all right, I quite like us being a bit more powerful. This is good. They wouldn't necessarily just, you know, throw their toys out the pram. But because of the way that things have progressed over the last four years... There's no there's, that trust isn't there, so but it's harder also, it's, to sell. It's, the audience is less receptive, I think. Yeah, but it's also where where it's played out as well. You know, the, the five day game is immovable. The five day game is untouchable. The, the the hundred is this bastard that's coming coming over the hill to destroy everything. And if you were to shift things to lose the former yeah. in favour of the latter, then even though there may be some kind of real politic value in that, there may even be question it whisper it some entertainment value in that well, yeah, quite. for for an increasingly progressive fan base uh it still would be kind of pr suicide to play it out like that mm. and and yeah. and while while we can be we can be frustrated by it i think you know and and i think most people are <clears throat> around this table are broadly kind of open-minded about the hundred that is not reflected among among the rank and file and, and, and something it needs else to be are working against that and their own Botch something else has just popped into, sell it. popped into my head during during that, and that is, of course, if you if you were to invite the IPL over at the back end of this summer, finish it off here, and you know bring all of the the, the razzmatazz that that inevitably comes with, you're then basically turning around and saying, well, there's not much wrong with T20. Are you? T20 is a fine format. In fact, it's the biggest format that there has ever been. Why are we bothering with one that's 20 balls less? <laughs> yeah, and so I, it's that. another reason why you can't do it. Yeah. But, you know, that, that one makes me smile a bit too. Yeah. yeah. No, I like <laughs> In that. In fact, that makes me laugh quite loudly. Of course, the funniest thing that could, <laughs> the best thing that could happen would be that they go through all the rigmarole of uh, taking this hit, taking this public hit, and then it just pisses it down all the way through September. Yes. And they don't get to play the IPL regardless. <laughs> that would be the ultimate yeah. way this could play you, you wait for a beautiful azure sky throughout that period where there's no but cricket. But then, yeah. well, you know, an Indian summer. You know, you, that, that, you could, that, I mean, it kind of doesn't matter, does it? Once you've signed on the dotted line that this is, this is, the, this is what you've bargained, then it doesn't matter if mm. they don't play a single game. They come over and watch it rain for a month. You've still got your, mm. you've got your deal. Mm. Um, but well, anyway, is, we, yeah. I don't. We should move on. It's, it's it's looking like the tournament will be held in the UAE um, for for the, the second half of the tournament. Um, ben, more positive news around the English Test summer. That's that's your moment of the week. Yeah, just this morning it's been announced that. Um, there's going to be 18,000 fans uh, at every day, I think it is, or at least the first three days of the uh, Edgbaston test against New Zealand, 
which it feels like we are slowly returning to normality as, as we have been in the last month or so. But with fans coming back into the stadiums in diff- to different degrees across different sports over the last month or so, the value of those fans has become really apparent again. I think it's suddenly been like you've realised what you've been missing and the sound of you know, the Leicester fans at the FA Cup final or watching people at the Oval the other day against Middlesex, that, sat, that feeling of something being alive and, mm. you know, and we get it, you get it with 2,000 fans, you get it with 3,000 fans, but with, you know, 18,000 Brummies kind of that's cheering England on, that's, that's 70% what... 70% that, of the grounds could Well, exactly, be. and, that, and that's, that's going to feel full. That will mm. feel very, very full. And it's, I think it's quite nice, quite apt, that Edgebaston, which feels like, for me at least, the kind of the heart of the English game. It's the, you know it's the most vibrant ground. It's the most kind of intense ground to play at. There's a reason why it was the fortress for about four years. <laughs> well, what, 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 hang on. What, what part of the country Look you from? You, <laughs> he says at the open. No, but, no, but I'm going from from my personal yeah. experience of the Test cricket that I've watched as a fan as well. Yeah. I've, not, I've 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 done games at the Oval as a fan and I've worked it and I've I've seen games and it's probably I think it's my favourite ground to visit. But in terms of that kind of raw febrile fan driven atmosphere Edge Baston mm. is the is the biggest and the best for and me in, in, in England it's only 15 days away as well how amazing is that we're, we're so close to it I've got so much um, work to I, do I, I, I echo <laughs> most of what, what Ben says <laughs> about 70% um, uh, and, and all of that and, and I wrote a kind of you know whimsical thing in the magazine about you know the, the, the poignancy of fans re- mm. returning and a celebratory moment all of that applies Except at Chelmsford last week. That's all I was saying. <laughs> I was there for Thursday and Friday. It's my hometown. Yeah. I love the place. But my word, 200 fans in Arctic conditions. Um, the COVID police running riot. It was... It <laughs> Don't was, think it we was, need to go into it too much. No, no yeah. it was quite an experience. Um, but I was surprised that the Oval, only having 2,500 fans and spread around the ground, not all in the pavilion, actually mm. was really nice. The noise they made when Burns got to 100, for example, on Sunday was um, yeah. much louder than I thought it would be. There were, yeah, and there were... Many well, I mean, 2,500 is kind of a good crowd anyway, yeah. isn't it? Championship cricket. So the, the, they put a... I think there was a limit of 3,000. You thought, well, they're not going to do unbelievably well, given the weather as well, mm. to, uh, to, break, to break that. But yeah, it was really, really nice. Um, the the way that the you know the way that the ground's built now it kind of holds the sound in a little bit better the the, the outfield is is about a, a quarter smaller now than it used to be so you kind of feels like everybody's a little bit more on top of the action and it was yeah it was really good and I see what was great you saw a hell of a lot of you know they look slightly miserable the kids it has to be said but you know parents <laughs> bringing, young, <laughs> bringing young kids in there was a there was a great moment a camera panned on these these two youngish girls they i mean they obviously would have been a, a, over the age where they're allowed to have a beer kind of like doing doing shots in the in the <laughs> pavilion and having a great old time you know it was kind of, whatever gets you through the day absolutely yeah. it was like a preparing but, for the, but the beauty of it was that it kind of as the camera panned around, and again, I don't know whether our director was kind of, you know, seeking them out, but it seemed as though the demographic was not, you know, grumpy old. I men saw that with, as well. It was a lot bags, younger. You know? It was a yeah, lot younger. That's what than... I thought. I, I thought yeah. that too. Um, yeah. I mean, that was really, really nice to see. And and as I said the kind of the crowd did get really got behind Surrey when, you know, when they were trying to trying to push on and, and put 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 runs on the ball for declaration and whatever, mm. and they, and, they, and they got a decent bit of entertainment. Whoever was left on on Sunday afternoon. Um, would have been a great an absolute burglary if, if Middlesex had yeah. won that yeah. match. But it, as it, as the game went on, it seemed more and more likely that the only team who could possibly win it on a sort of day two and a half pitch at the Oval would be the team batting last. Mm. Um, and so Middlesex got a bit of decent batting. And some of their batters looked like they knew which end to hold by the end. Yeah, of and it comes with nice. very good. Nick yeah, with played, very great. Good. played great. Played um, great. We'll get to the championship in more detail in a second, but I think it's worth covering the news that the Telegraph's Izzy Westby broke. Um, she broke a couple of huge stories around the India women's team this week. The first one was that 14 months on from their T20 World Cup final appearance, the players haven't actually been paid the prize money despite the BCCI having received it. Days later, it was reported that they would they would give the players the money after Izzy broke the initial story. Then a couple of days um, after that, Izzy also broke the news that the four players who lost their central contract recently will receive no payment for their work between October last year and May this year which means that during a seven and a half month period, those four players, Ekta Bisht, Daya Lyon, Hemalatha, Vida Krishna, Krishnamurthy and, and, and Anuja Patel were unable to seek alternative employment or income um, and will only be paid match fees and tour announces. Um, yeah, brilliant reporting and shows the power of it as well in that, obviously, what, what she's achieved in that. Um, yeah, unstoppable and well summed up as well. Um, yeah, Izzy is a, a one-off and... I mean, you know, it speaks for itself. You know, the 
the screaming inequities that are, that are playing out there. So yeah, mm. fair play to her. Mm. Hundred, hundred thanks. There's a there's a good piece on Wisdom.com by um, our newest staff member Sarah Warris, who actually basically kind of outlines where India have gone wrong since the T Twenty World Cup final. It's a timeline of uh, the mistakes they've made in not uh, building upon what was obviously a huge moment for the for the for the women's game. Um, I would recommend that as well. Um, on to the county championship. Um, we all know what the weather's been like. Um, I think we were totally spoiled with four good rounds at the start, but three rounds, we've barely got a game in. Um, just one result this week. We've got to start with Darren Stevens. Um, you know, he was 45, actually. Don't, don't oh, really? Didn't mention that. No. Um, well, if, you, if you've missed this, Kent were 128 for eight against Glamorgan before Stevens hit uh, 190 off 145, uh, and not included 15 sixes. Uh, in an 166 run, night wicket stand with Miguel Cummins. Miguel Cummins scored one. Uh, what kind of record <laughs> is that? Uh, I think it's joint most sixes in a championship innings. Yeah, no, I, I, it's one fewer. Because uh, Na- uh, Napier hit 16, didn't he? Okay, so one. Because Gardner, Gardner, yeah. Gardner was that poised last, to yeah. tweet it. Yes, yes, it? yes. But that it. last wicket partnership, that must be a, an all time uh, all-time record. I one. Don't... One not out, out of under. So I think that that is that is in terms of percentage of a partnership. I think that, that is a record. Must be. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Ever heard of anything like that, Mark? Any? It's just genius, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, we were we, we were sat here sort of watching watching batters tie themselves up in knots in the with, against the swinging ball, and meanwhile we've got the little you know the keys. He's got his computer out, and we're watching the feed from Gant. <laughs> watching Steve-O standing there and just pogoing it. It was it was yeah. joyous. I looked up his on his first class debut. I know we've done kind of like, oh, how old is Stevens? He was in a, a Leicester team against a Sussex side that had Bill Athey in the team who played Test cricket in 1980. Different kind of player. And two and two <laughs> future England coaches as well in Peter Moores and Mark Robinson. So he's uh, been around for a while. Um, I remember he gave an interview at the PCA Awards about seven years ago. So now I've got, I've got, I've got a two-year two <laughs> from Kent, you know, two-year contract, taking him up to 39. Yeah. This was yeah, the best part of a decade ago. Yeah. Um, extraordinary innings. One of the the all timers, I think. All yeah. time county county champ knocks. Yeah, hundred percent. And what was really nice as well is it felt that like you could see people engaging with it in real time in the same way that you know in the current climate with the champo, like people can just drop onto a stream yeah. in a bit more like you could just bang the telly on and watch yeah. it. So it was like you got your hardcore who are watching it and your keezy stats out there watching the whole thing, but you've also got people who are like. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll stick this on. This seems quite entertaining, and it's all part of the new, you know, being able to stream stuff. It's a different kind of fan. It's just like, oh yeah, I quite like that. I want to watch Darren Stevens whacking it for half an hour. Yeah. Whereas before, it would have just been a little a little byline in the paper, and people would have gone, oh, that's, that's pretty good. It would yeah. have, it would have yeah. been a stat. Whereas it was actually a bit of a it was a moment. I think it was, I think it was trending like number two in the Water UK. The moment. Yeah. What? In January. <laughs> and how, how often does that happen? In, you know, number two in the UK. To, what? In the on Twitter. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is... Must have been quite a day. Well, yeah. We <laughs> didn't want to take it away from it, but yeah. No, but you're right. You know, my, my old man texted me, you know, and, and, and I told him about the streams like, a few weeks ago. He said, what? Really? <laughs> I can watch Essex? <laughs> and, you know, he texted me and, and, and my mates were as well. And, and you're exactly right. That kind of connection with it would be remote until until yeah. recently. And, and, yeah, I mean, we've talked about this before, but mm. this is the perfect example of it. On a Saturday afternoon, suddenly... People can crowd round and really taste it and savour it yeah. in a way they couldn't before. Hundred um, percent. Not for the only side to win a game. Ben Duckett scored 177, not out. Luke Fletcher took career best figures, um, and after a very long run without winning, they they look very good. Uh, top of top of Group One at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I spoke. I think to, I called that. You did. Yeah, yeah. we won't go into our county no, predictions too much. <laughs> no need clocks. to do that. No need to do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, but anyway, after a very long run without winning, they're doing very well at the moment. I spoke to their captain, Stephen Mullaney, about their start of the season earlier on. It's been a great start to the season for Knotts. Not that long ago, Knotts had gone almost three years without a Red Bull win. And now you've had three really, really good wins on the bounce. What do you attribute that difference in performance to? <laughs> I don't know, actually. It's a really good question. Um, I, I, well, I think if you look back to... Obviously, 2019, we weren't great. We had <clears throat> like a new set of players coming together, probably not all pulling in the same direction, different things going on for different certain individuals. Uh, not not bad at all, but obviously, when you want to win as a team, you need to um, be pulling in the right direction, uh, same direction, sorry. Um, and I think if you look last year, we, we got um, Derby Chase 370-odd first game, which was a great chase by them, and it was a great game of cricket. And then... So only really the second we we didn't chase 180 against Yorkshire on a, um, <clears throat> on a on a good wicket. Um, we probably looked too far ahead of, of winning the game rather than um, 
you know, building partnerships, all the things that you get said rather than, so we saw the, the carrot at the end and sort of forgot how to do the middle bit, I suppose. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and that was the one, the one that was really disappointing. Probably a, a turnaround in, well, definitely my leadership and captaincy and how I went about things. And I did a few little things differently and, and went and um, sort of sourced a guy who I speak to quite a lot and, and who, whose job is in leadership. And that helped me. And then I think we, we dominated three games and, and couldn't get over the line, whether it be, you know, if it didn't rain, maybe we'd have got over the line, probably two of them. Uh, and the other one against Lancashire would have been a really good game because they batted well too uh, in the second innings when we made them follow on. So um, so we we knew, so we, we started some, uh, something special <clears throat> uh, last year. Um, and then obviously we only played five games because of the pandemic and then we went into T20. Uh, and then we had a real focus this winter on the red ball stuff. So we did a lot of things as a squad, getting tight as a group. Um, and then to see us reply at Worcester and Haseeb and, and Ben Slater to bat for, I think Has back for 30. I think he was off the field for seven minutes in the whole game, which was remarkable, really. Um, and then we, we had a sit down after that game and, and said, look, we're going to Derby. Obviously, having Stuart for as much as we've had him obviously helps when you've got one of the best bowlers in the world coming in, into your side. And then we played Derby on a wicket that, that was green, fast, bouncy, and we thought, you know, if we get this right, we've got a real chance because it suits our attack. And that's we've been trying to get pace and bounce in our wickets at Trent Bridge, which Steve Burks and his team have done a great job of, um, especially this season. Yeah, and then we had, you know, Ben Slater got a hundred, an unbelievable hundred, really, on, on day one there. Um, and put it, and I, I actually said to him, I said, look, what, honestly, I don't, I don't care if you've got hundred, what do you think is a decent score? And he said, I'll be honest with you, in the first 20 minutes when I was batting, I thought it was 250. And we got to a point where I think we were 192 for two. And we got bowled out for two, 260, I think, or something like that. So I was thinking, at the same time as we were sort of, uh, we got bowled out, so it was disappointing to lose a, a capitulation of wickets. But I was still thinking, look, if these lads get it right, we've got a chance. And we ended up bowling really well twice. Uh, bowling Derby out for 100 and, I think, 120 odd and 150 odd. Um, and that was that was sort of the, the monkey off our back, if you like. Um, first winning. I think 1,042 days or something like that. Um, yeah, so I think the belief in, in... That's a long answer to your question, I think. But, um, yeah, the belief you get from one win is amazing, really, and hopefully it continues. Mm. Talk to me about Luke Fletcher. I mean, he's obviously been a big part <laughs> for a while, but he's been on another level this season. What, what do you put that, that improvement down to? He's been a wicket-taking machine. Yeah, well, he's one of my best mates. So our kids are the same age, so we've grown... I've, I've not grown up together because I'm not from here, but the last sort of 12 seasons together. Um, it's just been a pleasure to see him. You know, he's, he's, he's as fit as I've ever seen him. His, first, his last ball is the same pace as his first ball. His accuracy has been uh, uh, unbelievable, really. He's definitely bowling as well as I've ever seen him. Um, and I think it's really simple. It's just he hits the stumps a lot more than everybody else at the minute. And he's bowling more overs. Um, he wants the ball. He's worked a lot in the winter with Kevin Sharon on varieties, but still he knows that his stock ball is very good, his position on the crease. Um, he's just been a pleasure to captain and, um, you know, long may that continue because he could do something really special. I don't think there's a bowler had 50 wickets since Andre Adams in 2011 or 12 or something like that. So he's got 31 at the minute. We know that there's a long way to go, but he's, he's probably not going to have a better chance. Yeah, um, and, you, and you kind of alluded to it earlier, but what, what's it like having Stuart Broad in the dressing room for, for this kind of chunk of a season? I can't speak highly enough about him this season. He's running every spell like it's a test match. Um, he loves playing for knots. He's he's very obviously well respected within the dressing room. When he speaks, people listen. Uh, and he's done a lot of speaking and what he says really bides into what we're trying to do as a club. Uh, hopefully we'll, it'll not be the last time we see him this season hopefully the gap between the New Zealand and Indy series he'll be available for hopefully both of them games but if not both then one um, and then who knows if the India test gets moved at the back end the, the Old Trafford one to fit the IPL in then um, hopefully he'll be available at the end of the season so he's been a pleasure to play with again um, and as I said I can't I can't really give him enough credit mm. Um, and again, another one of the players you mentioned was Lyndon James. He's, he's one of the newer names in the team. Uh, I don't think many of our listeners would have heard much about him. He's come in and he's done really, really well. Yeah, and it's not really a surprise to any of us. I think we've seen it. He's, he's talent for a few years now. He's, a, he's an Oxlade who's grown up on the academy. Um, and he's 
he's doing what we thought he, he, he could do. Um, obviously, his, his feet are well and truly firmly on the floor. Uh, he, he's a very level-headed lad. Um, very wants to learn all the time, wants to get better. Um, and hopefully, if he keeps his... And I know he will keep his feet on the ground. I think he's got a big future ahead of him. That's not putting pressure on him. He's still got things that he needs and wants to improve on, which is a thing, but he's been a revelation for us this year, filling that fourth seamer role and batting at five. A really important job. Um, again, um, just a great lad to have around the dressing room. And, and to finish off, I've got to ask you about the season need. Obviously, he's in great nick at the moment, got the England call-up today. Um, I wanted to first ask about what kind of impact has he had in the dressing room? He's, he's your vice-captain, he's the captain, the, the Royal London One Day Cup. Um, I think a lot of people might have been surprised that he's been given that leadership. Um, what, what's he like in the dressing room? Very, probably the opposite to me, <laughs> me, which is one of the one of the reasons that we offered him. Obviously, he's going to captain the Royal London. But offered him the vice captaincy as well. Was I think he's a great foil for me because he's really. So I'm not. I'm not kind of trying to say that I'm not level headed, but he, he's very calm. Um, when he speaks, people listen. He's very well respected within the dressing room. I, I, I'm not happy, I'm, I couldn't be happier for him to get a, a test recall um, into the squad. He's he's worked so hard over the last. Obviously, his season last year was hampered a little bit by the pandemic, um, but you could sort of know you could see he got a few fifties in them games, and you could sort of see that he was teetering on the edge of doing something special. And then to get back to back hundreds at Worcester, and then I think he got a ninety odd at Derby. Um, yeah, he's he's just obviously again a pleasure to play with. Lovely lad. Um, again, hopefully big things ahead. Mm, I watched his um, I watched his innings against Essex. I think he only got forty nine, but he looked absolutely he looked, he looked brilliant. He looked in great touch. Um, yeah, just 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 tell me a little bit about how Hamid the batsman. Um, you know, you played with him now for a couple of years. What are your impression? Yeah. I don't think you'll see many people hit more balls than him and, and work as hard on his batting. He's he's the you know, if he's out the night before, he'll still have a batting slot in the morning. And if there's no batting slots available, he'll say, "Well, can I come in before everyone? Uh, the nets go up." He, he just he's relentless with his preparation. Um, he learns quick as well, so he obviously had them a couple of tough years uh, at the back end of his Lancashire career, um, and probably realised that he had to to do something differently and get away from Lancashire for whatever reasons. I think the change has been great for him, obviously. Um, but as I said, I think I don't think you'll find a batsman who hits more balls than him. In definitely not in the county game. I don't know about internationally. I've never been there. But he's uh, he's relentless with his preparation, um, and you know it's been great to see him. No surprise to any of us again. Like I said about Lyndon, that he's gone and got the rewards that he deserves. Um, but you've mentioned the game, the Oval. I wanted to to kind of pick your brains on on an interesting chat you guys had on Sky about batsman's technique and how they've changed um, or how there's a trend in recent times of batsmen coming over more over off stump um, which obviously brings LBW into play much more um, I think there are lots of interesting things around this um, I just wondered the obvious counterpoint to that is there's a bloke called Steve Smith who does that so so why why do you think he can get away with it whereas other people can't Manus Labuschagne is obviously quite similar as well yeah, or is yeah, it just well, because they're freaks Manus, Manus is averaging 8 in the championship at the moment I, mean, I think 16 test cricket there, there are, there, exactly yeah. there, are, there are a couple of things here if if you're playing in, in test match cricket on good decks where the ball does not move laterally very much then it's probably not a bad way to go I don't, I don't think it's better than, than the old way or better than sort of not having a, an off stump guard but I think it's probably fine you know you back yourself not to not to miss it on the inside. Um, when the ball is moving around, however, I'm thinking to myself, crikey, you know, you, you really are giving the, the bowler a big target. There is another, another point, and it probably got lost in the, you know, it doesn't, actually doesn't matter where you scrape your guard out. It matters where your head is. Yeah. And if your head begins outside the line of off stump and gets further outside the, the line of off stump, you are disorientated as a batsman. You do not know where you're off stump. You don't know what to leave. You... How many times, and you guys have all played cricket, how many times have you you stood there and the bowler's run up, bowled a ball down the leg side and you've missed a leg glance, right? You missed what should have been an easy four four runs and it either hits you on the pad or, or passes by to the keeper harmlessly, right? And mm. you're thinking four runs, I've just missed it. 
Imagine if every time you missed a leg glance, the ball was actually hitting your middle and leg stump and you're out LBW. Right? Which is basically what is ha- what's happening to people. The bowler can run up and has, he can bowl it at middle and it can nip back and he can still get you out LBW because you're standing in front of all three. You think that the ball is passing down the leg side because, because of the position that you find yourself in. You think, you know, I'm, I'm close to off stump. Therefore, if the, ball is, if the ball is this side of my head, it must be going down the leg side. So you miss that leg glance and everyone's appealing. You go, what are they appealing for? That's going down. Oh, no, it's not. It's smashing my middle and leg stump out the ground. Mm. You know? What it also what also the guys have noticed and they you know they worked on the the games at, at Lords and at, at um, I think it was at Lords and at Cardiff yeah. was that not only not only does it bring the leg the, the the leg before much more into the game you can you know you kind of you're giving away more stumps for, to the bowler it also that they're still nicking it behind two you know it's not as, so it's not as though you're sort of like you you've eliminated one mode of dismissal and the other one is, is has, has been given a boost. You're defending balls that are way wider than you would normally have to defend. Nobody seems to play a cut shot anymore because they never the ball's never wide enough. And so it just listen. The conversation came about because we're, we're all kind of looking at it and going, "Wow, this is you know it's it's tricky. The ball is moving around. There's a bit of swing and a bit of seam, but it's the ball's not doing something that it has never ever done in the history of the game before. Um, you know, and and this seems to be a, a trend and a fad." Um, and we're trying to work out what the advantages to it are. Mm. Now, of it, clearly, these the guys that you mentioned, you know, Kane Williamson tends looks like he kind of goes over onto middle and off and all this kind of stuff. But I kind of watch him and think, well, how often does his head get outside the line of off stump? Almost never. So that there's a discipline there, there's a skill there in terms of his balance that that means that he that it doesn't become an issue for him. The issue comes with guys who literally, they, you know, they, they pick the bat up and before they know it, their head's six inches outside the line of off stump. And they have no idea where they are. None. Mm. Um, and obviously taking, a, taking, that, taking your guard that much further towards off stump makes it more difficult to know where you are. Um, you know, it gives you more of a chance of always being in the wrong position to start with. You know, batting's hard. You know, the whole point is that you're trying to, you, your setup is supposed to be there to help you, mm. not to make it more difficult for you. Yeah. It, it does come down to the head, the head position in the end, and that's the that's the first and final port of call, I think, for for a good player. And it absolutely stands to reason what you're saying that if you are if you are further across your stumps, then obviously you are opening up more more modes of dismissal to to the bowler. But what specifically interests me, and you boys touched on it the other day, is 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 how a batsman sets up in terms of their their contact position now and without a doubt since your day there has been a, a a change for better or for worse and the averages would suggest possibly worse mm. towards a more open chested uh, stance now um personally and obviously i'm no kind of player i play club cricket there right <laughs> but i have changed right now it's it's changed my game I've ne- I, I could never hit mid on for 25 years. Just couldn't hit it. Couldn't do it. Mm. Couldn't really hit the stumps. You know, I was all right through there. I was all right through the covers. Um, since I have opened myself up, it makes sense to me. It makes logical sense. And the head, I feel personally that my head is stiller and more balanced, and my eye line is more more vertical mm. because I've opened my stumps. Now, if I was, when I've been side on, I've always felt that I'm an LB, or I, I take middle and leg to kind yeah, of yeah. emphasize your point. So if I do miss one on my pads, then hopefully it's missing leg stump. But by opening myself up, I feel like that ball there, which used to get me out all the time, or used to cramp me up all the time, <laughs> I can now feel like I can hit that through straight mid wicket. See, see the, the interesting thing and is. And a lot of players are doing that. Physi- physiologically, some people are more flexible than others, right? So if, if, for example, you have a, a really stiff back, i.e. Mike Atherton in the mm. last five years of his career, Ather's got more open and more, more sort of chest on as his career yeah, went on because he, did, he yeah. couldn't maintain that position and keep his head up. Is that what it was then? Yeah. It was, but, yeah. It was physical, Ab- physiological. Absolutely. So right. if, you're, if it's more comfortable for you to stand like that and, and you feel like your eyes are going to stay more level, then, it, then there's, no, there's no issue with that. There's no hard and fast law that says you need to stay sideways on. And in fact, most players don't are not perfectly side on. Mm. They really aren't. Most players open up a little bit. But, but fundamentally, what you have to understand is the more you open, the more you open your hips away from sort of like the target of a right arm over bowler, 
the more your hands, your hands and your shoulders, they follow the line of your hips, which means that your bat is going to come slightly into out and slightly sort of across from, from gully towards mid on, right. as opposed to from, you know, from first slip to mid off. Okay. So if you, un- so if you understand that, and if you play within the confines that that gives you in terms of technique, like you think of somebody like S- Steve Smith, he plays within the confines of where his hands and where his hips and everything come from. Mm-hmm. If you understand that, then it's not a problem. Sure. But, but if you, but what I'm seeing is, is guys are kind of like doing this, batting on, batting over on off stump, <coughs> and and playing as though they're uh, playing as though they're batting on middle and leg with a sideways on technique. Now you can't that that you can't do exactly. You know, I, I would still I, adv- I, agree with I would that. advocate I would advocate absolutely that you're kind of making life more difficult for yourself, even if you do understand that. But if you understand it and you're disciplined enough to keep to it, I agree. Then all is well. I agree. But most, but what we're seeing is nobody is <laughs> disciplined enough, apart from the, the the incredible names that you've mentioned. Sam Robson's a good case study. Now, firstly, Sam Robson play, has played one of the best knocks of the year, right? And you know he's he's a very good county player. So I'm not knocking his record at all. And there are, as Atha said the other day. There is no hard and fast rule. No. And players find a way, sure. But when you looked at Sam Robson, I think you boys took him as an example. He's batting on off stump, but he's also batting on a very, very, very side on, right? So that ball that's in at middle and leg, he's having to come across a closed off front pad. He's having to, at the last split second, try and open his shoulders, while at the same time, offering that front pad to the, to the umpire. Mm. So that's a kind of, it's a double trouble there mm-hmm. you, you either you either go one or the other you either sort of stay side on and bat middle and leg or you go slightly more open chested and bat on off so bumped, we chances. bumped into the umpires Athers and I were doing a little pe- you know rain and whatever we were doing a little piece around the side of the ground looking at all the, the old the honours boards and the, the old t- championship winning teams or whatever and the umpires walked past us they'd obviously called the game and, and we sort of, we, you know, they me- we mentioned it to them and said, oh, we can see his pad. We're just like the finger is just constantly twitching in your body. Yeah, you just think yeah. you're going to give them out all the time. This is it. All you can see is yeah. just pads in the way. And, it, you know, yeah. and, and so the, the most successful players in that championship game, for example, where there was a little bit of swing. It was a good, really good pitch. It was a little bit of swing, a little bit of seam with the left handers. Mm. Left handers batting on regulation, middle and leg, right arm over bowler ball going across. That you know, they scored all the runs in the game, the lefties. The righties are just tying themselves in knots, trying to trying to do all of these weird things. You know, and, and again, I'd go back to the point that Darren Stevens is on the feed, standing standing with his bat on middle, his head over the line of off stump, any width, he smashed it, got a little bit too straight, he smashed it. Yep. You know, there was a simplicity in that when we, what we were watching is people doing Gordian knots at the crease sure. to a ball that is moving you know that wasn't those weren't seem it was a little bit dark and gloomy because the lights were on but that wasn't that wasn't going all over the place mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. is that going all over the place no one, one no. thing i wanted, i just wanted to say was that like it's not it wasn't just that game there is a prop there is a trend in test cricket of lbw becoming a, a well targeting the stumps being becoming a more relevant uh, kind of approach for bowlers if you look at um back at the start of the decade those deliveries from Pace bowlers targeting the stumps, bowl to a top order batsman, averaging mid to low twenties. Now they're averaging about 10, 11. And that's a that's a change over a decade. Now we've obviously seen batting averages drop across the board in Test cricket, but they have dropped more substantially into a high proportion in that particular zone. So whatever batsmen are doing, whether it's fashion or trend or whether they're getting their head in the wrong place or setting up on the wrong line, it's not working. Mm. And that's with someone like Steve Smith, you know, boosting that average by being absolutely ruthless against anything on his stumps. Mm. So there's clearly an issue there in the game as a whole, whether it is just a trend at the moment that people are just getting themselves in all kinds of knots. It's it's not like we are in the golden age of bowlers, but not that far. We haven't gotten, you know, batsmen shouldn't be struggling that much in that particular way. So there's clearly some kind of culture there is a, there is an issue there. For sure, there's there's a, there's a and and that's I think that's why that's why it came up. You know, we I don't think we would have gone there otherwise. But it kind of it's become rather than something that you sort of see every once in a while. I remember yeah. Nick Compton doing it in in sort of you know in, it, during his Test career, and he obviously done it for Somerset and been very successful. But I remember thinking watching Nick play. Um, I think it would have been Test match Lords against New Zealand, maybe that he just looked as though he just kept getting nailed before he'd moved. You know, he would stand still, very, very sideways on and on off stump. And as soon as the pace went above, you know, went above eighty-five miles an hour on a consistent basis, he always looked like he was late, always. Yeah. Um, and so that was the first time I noticed it. But it's, it doesn't become a big talking point until the critical mass starts to become this. This is all I'm seeing. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it, it, was, it, was an, it was, I suppose it was an interesting talking point. It's not often mm. you go into that sort of depth with, with technique and it becomes something that people are interested in. No, it, it is interesting. Uh, I had a question for you, Ben, related to this. What, what's the role of data analysts in technique? Because obviously there's so much more data around now. There's a lot of data around strategy, but how much does data influence coaching, if at all? Well, I think I think with regard to batting technique, there's, I mean, me and, me and Phil were, chatting before we jumped on it's like there's a danger of a bit of mission creep for data analysts because you're kind of you know you've got all this information like that thing i just said there about balls on the stumps mm. and it's like it's easy to kind of take that and then extrapolate too much and me to kind of wade in i mean if phil seen me but I, I i know nothing about how to set up and, and play cricket other than what the numbers show me so I've, i i lean on that and i think it's dangerous for people like who are not necessarily that skilled or knowledgeable about technique to go in but what i think is useful is if you know it's more about reaffirming points. So if, you know, Butch is doing some coaching and he's and a player is, they might know they're getting pinned, pinned LBW a lot, but they might not know that it's literally against every time a ball's on their pads, they're missing it. And everything on a fourth, fifth stumped line, they're averaging, you know, 200. Rory Burns is a classic for that. Rory Burns averages insane just outside of stump. He's brilliant outside of stump in test cricket. But anything slightly in tighter in... He's all over the place, and there's all these kind, there's all these kinds of little tiny margins for. And, and I bet discussion. you, I bet you, his numbers playing county cricket with the ball on his pads, he's, he's, it's the other way around. Because you just got that extra bit of time. Because it's to, a little bit slower. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think that's where it can come in. It's more illustrative, mm-hmm. maybe, for coaches and people who do know what they're talking about to kind of use it and lean on and it's you know even if it's just convincing players that no, mm. you are really bad at this you're really good at this make this tweak it's like Ol- Ol- Ollie Pope's you look at Ollie Pope's scoring areas over the last three years when he broke through it was like I think just under 70% of his runs came through the offside you talk about no one cutting anymore mm. Pope when he came through cut everything and was just, just you know lacing everything through backward point and now he bats not just on off stump but possibly well now le- well now less than half of his runs come through the offside yeah. so it's gone from 70% to about 45% and it's yeah. like you, the and player that we are seeing now is a different and player I, and I so I watch I watch him and think Christ I wish I could move like that you know he, he's he's unbelievably light on his feet he's unbelievably quick at judging length and all of yeah. those things and I'm thinking to myself why why would he do that yeah. because he's good like he's, in, he's, the, he's he, absolutely he, good enough not to bother I was you know you, you, so all of this goes on and People are sending videos around, all this kind of stuff, looking at Barry Richards and Viv and things play. Now, Viv was probably the greatest player off his pads that there ever was. You watch the way he sets up. Viv had that sort of like slightly stooped, we're talking about sort of athleticism and, and having a back that was going to work for you. But, you know, his, both his toes would have been on sort of, toes maybe on middle stump, and he leant over, on his, leant over on his back. But his head was like a, like a ramrod, like mm. on, on off stump. Yeah, and he would and he would press forward a little bit. Of course, he'd get his pad outside the loft stump, mm. a line of off stump, and smash it through mid wicket from over there. Yeah, of course. But his head never his head never ended up over this way. And I, I you know, the, the interesting thing for me, and I, I only thought of this after the show, was the, that thing that club players would do it this weekend how many times do you miss how many times do you miss that that little tickle down the leg side how many times do you kind of oh I've just missed out on four but you're not out we've got pro players missing leg glances and getting out LBW mm. and that to me is just barking yep barking mad yep no that, that, that is really interesting um I'm going to run through some other cricket that's about to happen and has happened before we get on to, to Ben's book um the Rachel Hayho Flint Trophy gets going this weekend uh, we've got a pre-recorded interview uh, with one of the stars of last year's competition, Charlotte Taylor, who spoke to Tara Hashim last week. She took a six for her in the final, and Tara spoke to her about 2020 and what she's hoping to get from 2021. Yeah, it's really nice that piece online. It is well. really nice. It is really nice. So let's let's start from from last summer. So you're three games into the Hey Ho Flint Trophy, and then you get put into the Southern Vipers squad. Can you talk me through the moment you get told that you're in? Uh, and tell me about the next few weeks for you and what they look like for you uh, all the way through to the final and, and taking six wickets as well. Well, it was, a bit, it was a bit of a roller coaster, if I'm honest, because I was just working at home. So obviously we'd all been, I'd have got a normal, um, normal um, nine to five job and we'd all been told to work at home. So I was just in my conservatory um, and the squad had already been picked um, a few weeks before. And I was told I was in a group of like a wider squad of 20 players and they were going to cut that down to 15 of which I didn't make those 15. Um, and, but I was sort of told, you know, at any point you could just be ready if there was an injury or something to come up. So 
Um, and then I got a phone call saying that they wanted me to come and join the squad of 15 players. There was a few injuries around the group um, and they just wanted to add me into the into the mix. And I never thought from there that I was actually going to play a game, if I was honest. Um, but I got an opportunity. Um, there was a couple of these injuries didn't sort of um, heal, if you like. And I got that opportunity to play in, in my debut at Hove. Um, and that was a fantastic experience. I mean, there was three of us that made our debut that day and three of us that had played cricket for a long time for Hampshire together. So that was really nice. Um, and I started the competition with two wickets and, and some really tight bowling. And I think I just proved to myself on that day that I can do the same sort of things that I was doing in my club, you know, three weeks previous um, and do it at a higher level. So I was, I was really happy with how the tournament started and it just went from strength to strength thing. I think I've just got confidence from each game that I was successful and just sort of proving to myself that I could, I can compete at this level and, and then all the way through to the final. I mean, I don't ever expect I was going to take six wickets. Um, I don't think anyone does. I think they're going to take six wickets in a final, but I've had the strong belief that I'm, I can be a match winner. Um, and I knew it, you know, I've had experience. I'm a bit older than the other girls. It's not like I was 17, 18 and making my debut or playing in a big final. I was sort of like played a, a fair bit of cricket. There was no crowd, which might have helped me. I didn't, you know, it was not, that would probably be a big difference to this year coming into the competition. Like if we're going to have sort of a few people at our first game, it's going to be a very different atmosphere. Um, so, but that day in itself, it was freezing the final. I can tell you that for free. It was absolutely freezing. Um, and I actually had tonsillitis. I really wasn't very well the night before. Um, I, I was really like, my tonsils got huge. And I couldn't barely speak. Um, but I knew I had a job to do for my team and, and we knew we had a, a final to win. So we just went out there and, and performed the best that we could. And we came on top of them. And it wasn't just me. I mean, that whole competition, we all of us contributed in some way or another. Um, and it's just the fact that we've got such a good, diverse group of people um, and players and we all offer something different to the team that makes us win the games of the Vipers. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, Georgia Adams batted that whole competition brilliantly and set us up for a brilliant competition with the bat and supported by Ella at the top of the order. And we had contributions all the way through from brilliant fielding. Um, everyone played their part and it just so happens that I contributed in that final, which, you know, I was pretty happy with for my own personal um, development, but you know it's it's a it's a team sport for a reason. So yeah. very happy to now take that confidence into this season. And as a team, I guess with the with the tournament coming up, how do you think you guys are? How do you think you guys are shaping up? And is there a team that you guys are looking at where you think they could be they could be sort of the big the big challenges to to us winning a second title? I think we're definitely going to be. The team to be. I mean, after last year, I think we'd be silly not to think that. Teams are going to come hard at us, um, but there it's a it's a different ball game this year because we've got two different formats. You've got the fifty over in the T Twenty, and teams might you know take to one more than the other. Um, and we're also playing everyone in the in the fifty over competition. Um, the T Twenties are still regionalised um, mainly, but the but the fifty over competition is is um, where you play everyone. So that will offer new challenges. We haven't played. Um, we only played the Northern Diamonds in the final last year. Um, we didn't get to have a look at them in sort of the group stages. So, you know, they're definitely a team that we'll be looking out for and because they were obviously good enough to get to the final. But every team is is got better and you would have thought with the winter, is, if every team's progressed like we have over the winter, then um, every team's going to be a threat. And just the likes of, you know, Lancashire and um, Central Sparks and, and Loughborough that we didn't, that we didn't see last year, um, we've got to be wary that they, they're going to come hard at us as well. But I think we're definitely up for the challenge. And hopefully if if we keep going the way we're going, um, I think we will win the second title. In the international game, we've had two the, the first two ODIs between Bangladesh 
and Sri Lanka, Bangladesh are two 0 up at the time of recording, meaning that Sri Lanka have minus two points from five games in the ODI World Cup Super League. The, the um, ODI World Cup Super League that yeah. takes up a lot of your life, doesn't it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Not, it not, just... <laughs> not quite broken through into the nation's consciousness yet, though, is it? It's not broken through into many people's consciousness <laughs> worldwide yet, but it will. There's it still will. time. There's still time. Um, sure. But the but the, the competition, if you don't know, determines the first eight qualifiers uh, for the 2023 World Cup and Sri Lanka. They're in real danger of not qualifying for that tournament at the moment because not only have they got minus two points, that's for losing every game and having really bad overrates in a couple of them. Uh, they've got India, England and New Zealand in three of their upcoming series. Um, so yeah, they're in, they're in real trouble there. Um, Scotland are 1-1 with the, the Netherlands after two games in an ODI series in the Netherlands. Uh, one very cool thing from the series, uh, a bowler for the Netherlands called Ayan Dutt has been bowling off spin to lefties but seam up to the right-handers. Lovely. That is. You don't see that every day. Um, And in Ireland, it's currently one all between Ireland women and Scotland women in the T20I series there. Ben, you have a new book out. Does he? I do. Co-written with Nathan (laughs) Lehman, who is an analyst who works with the England team. It's called Hitting Against the Spin. Um, And it has lots of chapters on lots of different things within the game. So you cover a lot in the book. Yeah, I mean, it's quite a... In some respects... It's obviously incredibly niche and very specific in terms of what it's covering, in in terms of looking through the lens of analytics and data at cricket and looking at all formats. But it's also, I hope, quite quite broad in its scope, and we try to try to cover all areas of the game. We the 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 opening chapter is like a long discussion about having won the World Cup, and it's all very practical and it's very much about you know using Nathan's experience in the dressing room and across the last five years that kind of much lauded Owen Morgan era of kind of changing mm-hmm. the face of ODI cricket in England and that it's very much looking at kind of the the reasons behind it and the structural elements which kind of helped you know the players themselves actually come through but then there are other chapters I think which are you know very theoretical and very technical a bit like we've kind of been discussing mm-hmm. today in terms of the, I mean the, the book takes its name from one of the chapters about hit, literally the benefits of hitting against the spin rather than hitting with the spin and how how English cricket has always been very nervous about doing the one and very keen to do the other and how counterintuitively, you know, mm. if you go against received wisdom, you can do quite well. And that's hopefully what the book's trying to do. Yeah. We're trying to kind of bust a few myths and hopefully not in too provocative well, a way. But it is called How and, Cricket Really Works. So and, and, and it's going to annoy some people. <laughs> and and is, is the Raoul Dravid model hitting against the spin, is that part of the book? Yeah, it's very much part of it. So the it's it's takes the form of a case study of when England went to the UAE and lost against Pakistan in was it 2011 12, um, 12 I think yeah okay yeah, yeah. so well, yeah start of 2012 wasn't it and then they oh, I was there with that yeah and they got absolutely bamboozled and by, by spin and couldn't lay about on it you know England's greatest ever side couldn't couldn't do anything and so they went away and they broke down their game against spin and they realized that one of the fundamental things that they were doing we talk about getting fully forward and getting fully back if you could that's the way to play spin there is data that backs that up. If you catch it in the middle, if you don't get it fully forward or fully back, then that's the most dangerous place to intercept a spinning delivery. And England were basically playing almost all the time in that danger zone. They didn't use their feet. They weren't getting fully forward. They were sweeping. They were getting caught in in all kinds of bother. And so then they started looking at, you know, the best player of spin in the world, Raul Dravid. And they were like, this guy never plays in this. He uses his feet or he goes right back. He doesn't sweep that much, but that's the model. And you hit, and then they kind of found a certain degree of, I guess, kind of wisdom there that you can just, you just, you know, you're essentially copying one of the great players. No great surprises there. But then they looked a bit closer and they found that he was also doing this thing, which is fundamentally not what English cricket knows and he's not necessarily received wisdom, which is that he was hitting against the spin. He was hitting, you know, if the ball's turning. Into. To, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the phrase. It's a, mu- it's a much kind of softer way of putting it yeah. rather than kind of sounds a bit aggressive against it. And they looked into it and you look at the physics and the kind of biomechanics, and that's very much Nathan's area and you can see his fingerprints on those chapters in the book, but you've essentially got 35%, 30 or 40% more bat if you hit against the spin. Really? You've got more, if, depending on how you, when you time oh, it, yeah. the margin for error is so much bigger. You can make so many more mistakes. You can be deceived in flight and still have the opportunity. Now, I'm saying that with the caveat, I don't know how to bat. But if you look at the numbers and you look at the the perception the batsmen have, and these guys who obviously have incredible eyesight and can see the ball all the way down, and you know, there's lots about the the way that elite cricketers perceive deliveries coming down. When you take all that into consideration, they have this huge advantage if you do hit in that direction. And overcoming that cultural thing within English cricket of yeah. you don't do that, you have to sit back or you have to sweep and you have to try and play them off their length. 
that was partly why England, you know, later that year won't go to India and they win it. They partly yeah. do it because there's, you know, the greatest generation of players that England have had and all those, all those brilliant batsmen. And he's have there's... KP in the team. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. But, and, and, you know, and they, they learned that and then five years later they come and they, you know, or well, however many years later yeah. they come back and they lose quite heavily twice. But the, the, the reason the, is the if you've got thing... the ability, you can, you can do that and you can gain a huge advantage. The, the, by great, that the great thing about that is, is, is trying to is trying to remove the perceived wisdom around the old way of doing it. That's, Absolutely. that's the most difficult thing. It was something that I, that I was very aware of in, in my career, or to, at least in the sort of the, the latter years of it, it was something my old man talked about all the time, was that if, if you think about having a square blade at the ball, if you've got to, if you're, again, I'll try and be right, from a right-hander's point of view, if the ball is coming down outside the loft, line of off stump and turning back into the right-hander's off stump, if you meet it, with the, with the square face of the bat as it spins towards you, you're actually playing with more blade than, than if you were turning the blade in the way that it was turning because you're, you know, you're meeting it with a tiny percentage of, of the bat. Yeah. And the key, obviously, the key to being able to do that properly is by having, is by having good footwork. Now, most of the time, I remember fielding at sort of silly point and places like that, watching Dravid play. The reason he was so successful of that is because everybody thinks about playing a spin, playing it off the front foot. Now, Raoul would, would almost exclusively get himself to the point where his back foot was almost on the on the tram lines where the stumps sit yeah he'd get next to the stumps or sort of like allow the which is again against what we're talking about but the ted dexter thing yeah. he would get almost parallel to the stumps show his stumps to the off spinner and hit the ball into the spin off the back foot yeah. now obviously a hell of a lot more difficult to hit into the spin when you're on the front foot but if your footwork is that good that you're turning you, you're making balls into half volleys and the rest of them you're playing off the back foot it's easy it's easy to do and i say that with inverted <laughs> yeah. commas of course but that but the idea the idea is absolutely 100 percent right and it's the footwork that makes it you have to you have to be willing to go a hell of a long way back and it's not just it's not just mid crease it's kind of almost knocking your stumps over depth um which then in turn forces the bowler to bowl fuller, which means you get more half volleys, which means you can pretty much hit the damn thing wherever you want, into the spin, against the spin, with the spin, whatever you like. You take like. the risk out of it. Absolutely. It becomes, it becomes a lot more straightforward. And that's, that's the essence of it. Absolutely. But perceived wisdom is still, I mean, and you hear, uh, you know, you hear commentators talking about it of a certain gen generation maybe, or, you know, you, you go to the, your club game at the weekend and the old fellas doing the coaching will talk about playing, but they're, they're not wrong. But there is just a better way, there is just mm. a better way of doing it if you are skillful enough and fast enough on your feet. And you know, think about playing spin. I always remember the story that KP says about talking to Dravid and how he would then practice against spin. Take your pads off, forget about your pads. Don't you know? Don't be thinking about getting your getting bat, bat and pad together. Learn how to hit the ball with the bat. Yeah. And, and and if you learn how to hit the hit, getting hit on the shins hurts, right? So <laughs> so you you suddenly find ways of getting deeper in your crease, turning good length balls into short balls so that you can get the bat on them and then the half volleys become easier to mm. hit and, it, and KP goes into all of that detail when he talks about playing spin all from Dravid and all from you know bucking perceived wisdom about how you play spin and what I think can be quite instructive about it is that as you say like this isn't stuff which you know we've come up with or, or Dravid invented this is stuff which players for as long as people play the game people have taken that approach but when it's one person trying to convince whether it's a dressing room or a batting order, like no, this is some we have a lot of success if we do this. Yeah. If then you need to do incredibly well, you need to nail it. Mm. So the the margin for error in terms of how you can be you can be convincing, you need to yourself score loads of runs, and then everyone else needs to be buy into it. Mm. Hopefully, what I think part part of the book can do is that we're not reliant on going out and delivering it ourselves. We can look at it in the, in, in the, in, in the, in the, in the macro. That. But, <laughs> but I think that opportunity to look at things, you know, with a bit more scope and a bit more kind of perspective, people can kind of take slightly, slightly counterintuitive mm. uh, kind of recommendations on, mm. I think, because mm. it's not just, you know, you know, if Butch goes and tells everyone in the sorry dressing room, oh yeah, you should, you know, hit into the spin and then you went and out of net and you missed everyone and you look like an absolute chump, then they're probably not going to... Regulation. Gonna, well, yeah. <laughs> but you're not going to, uh, you're probably not going to take it on board as if, you know, KP yeah. says, oh, just, just sweep. And, or, or if Root says just sweep and then England suddenly starts sweeping, it turns out everyone's not as good at sweeping as Joe Root. Yeah. So I think there's a, there's a benefit to it, I think. Question for Butch. Um, Obviously, uh, you didn't really have as many analysts when you were playing as, as you have now. Uh, what, what do you think a player's reaction would be uh, when analysts suggest certain things 
I don't know how it works if they talk directly to batsmen or batting coaches, but if you know that data is coming from analysts, you know, what do they think about these nerds with laptops telling them about yeah, I don't, their you know average what? I don't know. I, I really don't know. I mean, some, some of them, and this all comes down to personality with batters. And there was a, there was a little bit of this, but without the, being driven so hard by the data, um, you know, that started in around about sort of the 2000 stuff where you'd have the computer there and whatever. And you'd notice that certain players after they got out would go straight to the computer and be looking at what they did wrong or whatever. And there'd be others who would never. I, w- I was one that would never. I didn't want to see bad stuff. I wanted to see, see good stuff. I wanted to feel good stuff. And so you already had, you already had a sort of like this, this, the different personalities in terms of the people who play the game, in terms of how much they want to know or how much of a reason that, that they need to have to, to justify themselves the things that they did. Mm. Um, and, and that's kind of where all the data comes in. Now, I'm guessing that there will be guys in the England dressing room who are now surrounded by data who will kind of use it to go and reinforce good stuff about themselves and won't look at anything else. And there will be others who are forever asking questions about why have I done this? What percentage of balls pitching in this area am I doing that? That want to know everything. Um, and so I, I don't know. I mean, listen, it, I think... If you if somebody comes to me and says and says look you you know I'm having a bad trot so you know this already this is not this is not news to you, um, you know, do, did you know that X you know when whenever the ball is in this area you do this and the outcome is X I think you would be like okay yeah I'll look I'll have a look at that mm. I'll, I'll st- you know there's a famous the- Stuart Broad thing about how he was told by the knots analyst mm. that uh, batsmen were leaving his balls more than basically every other bowler yeah and he was like oh yeah maybe you should bowl a bit I straighter bowl a bit, <laughs> bit fuller or yeah. a bit straighter yeah. no exactly and, mean, al- and also that actually his average was better when he- people were leaving leaving him less so it, yeah. was, it was about yeah making the batsman play and that's such a basic thing it's, that's again <laughs> it's not new but being able to put, being that. able to look at you know, being able to literally show people this is your record when you do this this yeah. is your record when you do this that's so much more convincing to players mm. and at the end of the day if you tell players this will help your game mm. yeah some are just going to go oh, shove it I don't yeah. go. and some are going to push back but the majority are going to listen at the very least yeah. and even if they don't admit that they've listened and taken no it and, but, but it's going to help it's, I think that the point the point is is that everybody that everyone will will silently in their own time want to take that on board there are there are t- good times and bad times to, to approach people with this sort of stuff yeah. Um, you know, Most uh, there's no, there's, I don't think there's a single, I don't think there's a single guy that I'd have played with who, if you'd come to them with something that was genuinely and provably going to help them, I mean, that's the important bit to help them would tell you to go and shove it. Yeah. One thing which does, ha- which definitely uh, kind of falls in that realm is when you can say to a player that uh, what they did, which may have been seen, may have seemed wrong or even kind of be ridiculed was actually the right thing to do. And there's a, um, there's a chapter in the book about how, the best way to win on flat wickets around the world, but particularly in Asia, is actually to bowl first. If it's a flat track, over time, as long as the pitch doesn't absolutely break up to a ridiculous degree in the last session, provably it's the best way to, to, to perform is to, bat, is to bowl first, which obviously is counterintuitive. Captains don't do it. And yet, if you look across history, it's a rough balance between the two in terms of batting first and bowling first. Who wins the game? And um, and it's kind of it's quite a playful way of approaching it. And I think Nathan's just trying to kind of poke the bear a little bit. But he did he did some um, he did some analysis using the Winvis model, which he had a hand in the original version of. And he basically decided, and you know, might want to stick your fingers in your ears for, for this, but he basically decided that NASA was right at the Gabba. <laughs> that. I was going to say statistically, get an advanced copy statistically, years ago. He had the be- he had the best cha- they had the best wow, chance. You've just lost me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that's, the point that's, that's, horrend- that's horrendous because I tell you why can I tell you why that's horrendous? I did say stick your fingers in your ears. <laughs> because by the <laughs> because by the time we came to bat last, the cracks on that pitch were about that freaking wide. Yeah, no. I, well, the, the the reason why he says it as a playful a playful idea is is that you look at the Australian side. Essentially, the model said, "Lads, you weren't going to win that game. Didn't matter whether you bowled first. No, absolutely. Or whatever. So it the, didn't. But but actually, the best chance statistically for you to for yeah. that for that side, those players on that day on that pitch. According to the model, who knows whether that's reliable yeah. or not, but according to the numbers, that was the best way, that was the best was, route to success. Was chasing something with Shane Warne bowling on a, bowling on a minefield in well, the it didn't, last innings. It, yeah, well... He did, well, he did, because... He, oh, no, we, no, 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 I'm just saying we, it was Shane Did Warne. we or did we not <laughs> get, bow, get bowled out for 90 batting last in that test match? You should probably know. 
But well, we did. <laughs> I think. I think we the po- did. The point we is did because I got forty-five of them. I did check. I checked. Right. This, I, I, checked <laughs> I checked this morning. I did check. No, but, but I think into the spin. Which is <laughs> yeah, you know what I said about poking the so bear. Don't come, <laughs> so don't no. come at me with that nonsense. <laughs> Best forty odd I ever got. But that's the but that's the joy of it. I think is that part. You know, throughout the book, there is going to be moments where you know when you're prodding at all this kind of yeah. stuff people are going to kick back and actually I think that's quite fun like, I I I'm not, I, w- I, wouldn't, I wouldn't expect which to go yeah you know what actually when I was fielding for two days watching Hayden make 200 <laughs> that was absolutely the right call no, but I do, the thing is I agree with you in, uh, from, a, from a captaincy point of view I remember, remember doing this and having a huge row with my old man um, early season in a game against Sussex where we'd lost the whole of day one of the game so yeah. it's let, now a three day match and I said to him if I win the, the pitch looked flat and I said to him if I win the toss I'm bowling first and he was like, well, why are you doing that? I said, well, because we could knock him over for 150, score 300 and, and win the game with no time. You know, we don't, we're, not, we're going to have to rely on a, a declaration or anything like that. We, that's the only way I can see it, that naturally we could win a that's game That's the cricket. route to success. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and we, we still row about it to this day. <laughs> um, and of course I was right. Um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, I absolutely agree. It was like the, the game out here at Surrey Middlesex. But at the... the, the Middlesex had to win the game as far as I could see it. Had to, in order to stay in. So my argument, the only thing I think Surrey did wrong was they didn't kind of go hard enough batting-wise. They, sh- they, they could have left Middlesex 320. Middlesex would still have had to have gone for it. And if they didn't, then they're, they're more of sitting ducks in the last six, 60, 70. I didn't, wasn't worried about the amount of overs Surrey left themselves to try and win the game because it's the oval. And it's, they, only, they, only, they only had two days worth of cricket on it. It was always going to be flat. I just felt that they could have pushed harder in their second innings to make sure that they had more runs than Middlesex were capable of chasing. Mm. The, because the, 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 side batting, the, the side batting fourth in that, in that context is always the favourite to win the game yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. The, one, one thing that's quite interesting in the book that it, it focuses on lots of different things and kind of goes into uh, minutiae detail in some, in some respects over technique, but also... Um, broader outlooks on on certain stories that happened uh the england world cup example is, is is probably the best example of that and there's one bit that i thought that was just quite funny uh so look looking at like what had gone wrong before the 2015 world <laughs> cup so what did the analysis show were england as bad at world cups as everyone seemed to think well the short answer to the question was yes the slightly long the slightly longer answer was yes they were really really bad um <laughs> which is quite good but yeah you kind of looked at kind of the analysis england did after 2015 which is which quite interesting well yeah and part of the part of the selling point there i hope be no point in buying this thing is it <laughs> <laughs> Part of the selling point of the book, I hope, is that we're not just looking at the analysis. The guy who was doing the analysis is the guy who's writing the book. It was Nathan. Nathan was an integral part of that England dressing room and and part of that that era of English cricket, which was playing cricket in a different way and playing white ball cricket mm. in a way which you know England uh, tentatively at times throughout the history had, but never for a prolonged period of time. Mm. And so, part what part of what Nathan was asked to do was to come up with essentially kind of what what do teams who win World Cups do? And of course, he said, well, they you know, bat a ball well they feel well they're experienced they deal with pressure well and then you go okay what is the most important indicator of success at world cups what is the what are the elements that we can control and reprioritize and what what nathan found was that if you look at all the world cup teams and how they've the world cup winning sides and what they've done in the years prior and in the tournaments themselves their actual bowling ability was quite not irrelevant to whether or not they won the world cup but it was much less significant than their batting ability. And that was over a long period of time in terms of the actual success of the players involved and as a team, batting ability was a much better indicator of who would go on to win the World Cup, which annoys people because it's the old thing of like, well, batsmen with your matches, bowlers with your tournaments. Mm. But actually that's not backed up in, in the numbers. And so part of, you know, England were lucky in the sense that they had a glut of young white ball batsmen who could be backed and they could say, yeah, we're going to prioritise our white ball batting. We think this is our best route to success. Mm. But also the numbers would have suggested that was the best way to do it anyway. So that kind of natural group of players that just happened to arise at that time in English cricket was given their head and given the opportunity to, to succeed and play. You know, they played all those matches with basically the same core of players for, for four years because England knew that creating a batting order that was elite and top class was more important than the bowling. And so the bowling came in and out across the years. We saw so many bowlers come in and play. You look at the, you look at the bowlers who played in 2015 and 2016 it's nothing like the bowling attack who kind of mm. progressed over time, whereas the batsmen are the same, it's the same core. Part of that is part of the reason why that batting core is so good, and that's one of the contentions in the book, is the idea that this was a group of batsmen who grew up playing 
their list day cricket in England were 40 overs. So they were, you, you look at the run rates from bef- before they, before the English tournament was, um, English list day tournament was 50, was 50 overs and the run rate was such and such. Then it was moved to 40 overs. And that's when, you know, Butler and Root and Bairstow and Stokes all made their debuts. And then they switched it back to 50 overs. And the, ru- and, well, and the run rate went up during the 40 over tournament. And they switched it back to 50 overs and the run, run rate stayed the same. Do you know what's interesting about that? Because I argued this all the way through the 90s. Was it that 40 over cricket, which was the staple of sort of, of white ball or, or, you know, it was red ball. 87 World Cup, England got to the final. 92 World Cup, England got to the final. Um, didn't play any 50 over cricket professionally. It was 55 or 60 and 40 every weekend. You know, there, there was this whole argument about, you know, oh, the Pro 40 is a disaster. Why are we playing Pro 40? We should be playing 50 over tournaments. It's a complete waste of time. I always thought it was the best game we played. Yeah. Hell of a lot of fun. You, you kind of, you have to, you have to score a little, you have to score at a higher rate or all that kind of stuff. And I always felt, and this, this is probably, this probably doesn't get reflected in the book. I always felt that county teams did not have enough quality bowling in them to make 50 overs a good game. Yeah. Whereas 40 overs was a good game. Just tightened it up. Yes. There's that quality yes, throughout. Exactly. Exactly. Exactly that. And so it was kind of, it, the 40 overs was the equivalent of playing international 50 overs. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Absolutely. And, and, and I think that that's partly why these guys that were coming through, they were used to having to face high quality bowling throughout the innings and score quicker. There wasn't that lull, that little, just that little bit where the intensity just drops. And it's partly, I mean, this, is, this isn't in the book, but it's partly why I'm, I'm a, I push back on the idea that, you know, we have to make sure our players play in the blast um, and not the 100 if they're going to go on and succeed in international T20 cricket. I know that the dip, because the difference is even less. The difference between 100 cricket and T20 cricket is, you know, it's, it's a couple of minutes, basically. So the idea that you couldn't make the leap from a 100 game to a T20 game is even more, even sillier. If they can do it from 40 mm-hmm. to 50, but that's, that's by the by. But I, I think that, that that chapter, hopefully, for people who've read the story of, you know, Owen Morgan's reinvention of, of the England team and they've seen they've seen read all the interviews and they've read everyone's book hopefully it sheds a little bit of light on the kind of structures that were going on behind it because this was all introduced by Strauss who obviously wanted to prioritize white ball cricket in a different way to before and so hopefully it kind of pulls back the curtain a little bit on on the yeah the, as I said the kind of structure behind it not just the players we all know Ben Stokes diving and it going for five but it all started four years before we know that but like mm. quite where I think it's, it's there's more there it, it, Incredibly, it started the first morning after the first morning of the first game after the 2015 disaster when yep. I, can't remember, I think it might have been at Edgbaston. I can't. I think it was. And Jason Roy, second first or second ball, just smashed one straight to backward point. And Ma- Martin, like, Martin Guptill, who, who there you go. Well, and it was almost like Owen Morgan said, "Well done, <laughs> exactly that." But second ball, naught. But you've gone at it, yep. and then Root came out, strung the seventy ball hundred. They, you know, they three hundred and plenty, and that five test, five ODI game uh, series against New Zealand was a sudden and immediate change yep. of philosophy, attitude, and application. Um, and you would have assumed that dragging its ass out of the shamozzle of that that twenty fifteen World Cup would have taken a bit of time yeah. for it to bed down into the culture, but it didn't. It took it took a day. Well, what's interesting as well is that the classic quote from the 2015 Shamozzle was Peter Moore's, you know, looking which like mis- looking like someone shot his dog saying we need to look at the data, which, which was could, misrepresented. Which was misrepresented. But also, that England team used data less than the team that preceded it and less than the current team. They didn't rely on data particularly. It was actually something, there was a, a, misconnect, a disconnect there in terms of what the, the kind of cricket Owen, Morgan's want, Owen Morgan wanted to play. The data generally across sports says that the best the best route to success is to always attack is to attack more. The data will generally recommend a more aggressive approach, and then that's when you enter the human realm of trying to deal with pressure and trying to convince people that actually you know you've got all these skills you can you can execute them. And it's partly why Morgan's you know he sometimes tips over into parody a little bit of like you know executing our skills. And as you say, like well done, you've slapped it to backward point. But Morgan writes, he wrote the forward to the book and, he's, and he kind of, he talks throughout that about how having the data to kind of push the, the, the team in this particular direction 
almost gave him the license to kind of, to to know in himself that this was right and I can kind of keep drumming this into these guys. I mean, when Sam Billings was on the show a couple of weeks ago, or last week, it's like you could you knew that that dressing room was was moving in a particular direction, and it wasn't just because Morgs had decided, oh, this is the way that I want to play cricket. It's because actually it was the best route to success. Mm. And you see it in other sports as well. It's like Pep Guardiola doesn't play try and play beautiful football because he thinks that there's an aesthetic value to it. It's like that's the best way to win the game. It looks very high, you know, highfalutin and fancy, but actually that particular philosophy is what they think is a pragmatic way to win a game mm. and, no, it's backed up, if, and it's backed up by numbers keeping, as if being able to keep the ball was a good idea in football <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's that's all fascinating so ben remind us what the book's called and where people can get it uh, the book is called hitting against the spin how cricket really works um phil is holding it up to the camera as we speak it's got lots of fancy diagrams on the front which make it look a little bit boring but i promise it is very 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 uh, kind of you engaging and interesting two square on here by the way <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> terrible back two side on that. <laughs> well ori- originally we were, originally we were going to try and have a player but then we couldn't uh, we couldn't c- couldn't kind of focus on who was the ideal person to have on the front in terms of the, the ultimate technique but yeah hitting against the spin how cricket really works by uh, by me and, and Nathan Lehman you can get it on on Amazon at the moment it's probably the best place to pre-order it because it helps our uh, helps our algorithm we're all beholden to the algorithm Fant- so. fantastic fantastic and it's, out, and, it's, sorry, and it's out on June 10th um, start of the second test against fantastic. New Zealand and before we end the show a reminder of the Wisdom Shop in, in, in the run up to Father's Day we've got lots of there we've got prints by Andrew Redden we've got film posters of memorable moments from English cricket's past uh, we've got We've got beer, whiskey, whiskey. gin, whiskey, uh, glassware. Yeah. We've got loads. We've got loads. Uh, so head over to wisdom.com forward slash shop to get hold of that. Um, that's all we've got time for. Phil, cheers. Ben, thanks for joining us. Butch, cheers. This has been the Wisdom Cricket Weekly Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, tell your friend, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and we'll be back next week. Cheers. <laughs>